Hassett is our guest this morning. He's the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, this is his first interview sitting down since uh, he spoke to 40,000 or so Berkshire shareholders over the weekend just across the street from here. Um, Warren, thank you very much for joining us this morning. I was kind of thinking back, and this is 52 years now that you've been doing the annual meeting, and the annual meeting has changed quite a bit over that course of time. But in reflecting back on the weekend yourself, what, what was your headline out of this weekend? What was your takeaway, and what did you think? I would say people continue to have fun. I mean, you know, it's a kind of half Mardi Gras, half annual meeting, and they come for, and, and uh, uh, I see thousands of them ate at a steakhouse last night. There were a couple hundred there. They're all smiling, and and uh, you know, there were planes that didn't fly, and a few things that uh, they run in inconveniences, but they they have fun, and they they meet a lot of people that uh, 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 that they saw the previous year. As a matter of fact, when we went to the steakhouse, the directors all went there. The same guy picked up our check. That's probably picked it up for ten straight years, and he's, he's happy there. You know, and I'm, I'm trying to find out where he's eating today, actually. So that you can buy him lunch, uh, uh, <laughs> or so that me. you can show up and, and get another free lunch. Yeah, it. No, it, it, but everybody's in a good mood. I mean, they're clapping at the, <laughs> at the steakhouse, and they they come because they expect to have a good time, and and we try not to disappoint them. Well, we um, watched a lot of different things and heard uh, so much from the Q&A this weekend, and I was trying to figure out a theme myself. One of the ones, the themes that stuck out with me is technology and how much that was discussed this weekend. For a guy who claims that he's not really a technology guy and, in fact, doesn't even own a smartphone, uh, you spent an awful lot of time talking about technology investments that, that you made or, or, or didn't make, that you missed out on. I was thinking in particular... Uh, about Apple, um, that you talked to quite a bit about why you got into that, IBM, why you are selling some of that stake. But you also talked about companies like uh, Google, where you said you missed it. And maybe, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that for people. Yeah, well, who I did miss it. it but uh, uh, Charlie actually brought up the fact that mm -hmm. we missed it too. And uh, Google, I should have had some insight into because Geico was a heavy user very early on. So here we saw value in something at at that time I have no idea what we're paying per click now, but but we were paying ten or eleven dollars a click for something that had no cost of goods sold and we were gonna keep doing it. I mean we could see that. So uh, I should have had more insight into that. Now whether Bing was gonna come along or other people were gonna take away the market, that's another question. Whether you had sort of a, a first user advantage that would be uh, would prevail, and there is a lot of technology to it. So, so somebody could have come along with a better technological product, and I would not have had any insights into that. I certainly had insights into the benefit for the user. I think uh, Blazer Surgeon or something like that. I think it may have sold for sixty or seventy bucks or something of the sort. And mm -hmm. Mesothelioma. I mean, that, I don't know what it brings now, but just imagine having something every time you just hit a click. You know the cash register run somewhere out in California. So it, it was an ex and is an extraordinary business, and and it has some aspects of a natural monopoly. I mean, it, uh, it's very easy for me when I go to the computer. I've, I've I've worked with Google before, and but I'm looking for information for the annual report. I used to have to mail away to federal agencies or go down to the public library, and now I can get it in ten seconds. So it's. It's a hugely valuable device, which the other guy pays for. The the, the, uh, the user of the computer doesn't. So the, the answer is we missed it. And I knew the fellows. They came to see me before they did Sir Gary and Larry came to see you. Yeah, and actually Eric did too. And Eric. Yeah, yeah. I liked him. So when you say you missed it, that, that suggests that it, it's now at a valuation. You understand the company, but it's now at a valuation that doesn't make sense to you. Why don't you just buy it now? Well... If I was forced to buy it or short it, I'd buy it, same way as Amazon. But it's a little hard when you look at something at X and it sells at 10X to buy it. It shouldn't be. But I can just tell you psychologically, it's harder if you looked in the first place and passed it at X to then buy it at 10X. That's cost people a lot of money in Berkshire. I mean, they, they saw it at a lower price. and. They just said, if it ever gets back there, I'll buy it. That's a terrible way to think, but... but the uh, train has left the station, as yeah, Joe exactly. likes to so frequently exactly. point out. Yeah. How come you don't feel that way about shares of Apple? How come you feel like that's a different story? Well, uh, the, the shares, when we bought them, at least, were much more reasonable in relation to current earnings. Apple didn't have to do a lot better in the future than they were doing at the current time. Uh, 
when you get into uh, a Google and Amazon, you're paying for the future more. But that may, they may well have a better future. I mean, that may be more than justified. Uh, but uh, and Apple, uh, I wouldn't say it's easier for me to understand than Google now, perhaps, or Amazon now. But uh, certainly would have been five years ago. Uh, uh, it's amazing where uh, Apple's and or uh, well, where yeah, Apple's ended up with consumers. I mean, I I can very easily determine the competitive position of Apple now and and who's trying to chase them and how easy it is to chase them. We happen to be well situated in terms of having these massive home furnishing stores and and. Uh, uh, I can learn very easily how consumers react to different things uh, there, uh, probably easier than I can uh, trying to pick out what's really happening at Amazon at any given time. So you use your research at the, the Nebraska Furniture Mart to to tell you that consumers prefer Apple over Samsung, or I mean, what what type of thing are you? Well, the interesting thing is if you if you come in to buy a TV set, at the Furniture Mart, a price is extremely important now. Obviously, pictures. But there's all those great pictures just sitting up there. So you, you can have Samsung. You have all these different uh, ones. And uh, if you put on a sale, uh, and you drop the price of Samsung 10 percent, we can fill that department with people that come out for it. Uh, you can't move people by price uh, in the smartphone market remotely, like you can move them in appliances or all kinds of things. I mean, people want the product. They don't want the cheapest product. And uh, the <clears throat> loyalty is huge. Now, that doesn't mean somebody can't come along with a product that, that just jumps the field in some way. But uh, And then once you have the product, the degree to which it sort of controls your life, I mean, it's a very, very, very valuable product to the people that build their lives around it. And that's true of 8-year-olds, and it's true of 80-year-olds. Uh, people who who have questioned Apple's future have said things like, "Well, right now people are paying eight hundred dollars for a smartphone, and uh, the other reality in technology is that prices eventually come down. Uh, and unless you're adding more and more value to that product, the price will come down. So what happens if people? Uh, I mean, I guess the question is, will people always be willing to pay eight hundred dollars or more for a phone, or will that wind up being a cost that comes down and down uh, just well, as technology? Well, it, it can be that way, but. Usually, because there's competition between different pr products, and some manufacturer decides that they can't beat, say, Apple on their own terms, so they drop them 100 bucks or 200 bucks. Some products are very susceptible to that, and other products are not. And uh, so far, I mean, you've had smartphones and big differences in price categories, and and people come back in, and if they had an Apple before, you can have a much cheaper cell phone. Uh, selling right next to a smartphone, selling right next to it, and they don't look at it. Hmm. If you have a cheaper TV, that picture's looking at you, and, and you say, what, wait, 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 what's the difference? Right. <laughs> and you buy the cheaper TV. And, and that's true of, I mean, most items are price sensitive. And it's not to say that uh, an Apple isn't, has somewhat price sensitive. It's very, very, very little. That, but somebody could come along and leapfrog something in the way of the technology, and it adds some benefits. That, that that would be the more competitive threat to me than price competition. It would be benefit competition. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but then, you know, Apple gave me a whole lot of things that I never realized I needed That's until the they thing. came up with them. <laughs> and somebody else was trying to think of some other things to give you along the same line. Right. Uh, let's, let's talk about just the stock price again. You said that it made sense to you when you started buying into it. Um, shares have appreciated since That's then. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheap. <laughs> And there's always an anchoring problem with, with, with buying stocks. If you get used to buying them at X, it's harder to buy them at higher prices. So does that signify that you've stopped buying an Apple because of where prices have well, come? Well, maybe, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you slid it in there nice. Yeah, so. yeah I've tried. <laughs> um, I, I guess when you see things like the earnings that came out, you had mentioned to us the other day that you weren't bothered or disappointed by the earnings. When you see the stock all. price pullback, you, you probably like it at that point. Oh, yeah. I mean, Apple, with a non-new product, I think they sold something like 50 million, you know, or the, that's a lot of units to sell at $700, and a lot of those are going to people that 
they're actually replacing a present apple. Uh, but they do know that a new product's going to be out in six months or something. And, and you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe they got promised an apple for their birthday or their graduation. But I would be tempted, if I were going to buy one, to wait till a new model comes out. I, what, what do I lose by doing it except the use of one in between? Uh, that's a lot of product to sell when, with a new model coming out when you think about 50 million. Uh, we've talked to you pretty extensively about IBM. Um, Andrew and I got the chance to ask questions from the stage at the shareholder meeting this weekend, but we each only asked about six questions, and we got thousands of questions from shareholders. <laughs> One question that did come in from a shareholder that I didn't get the chance to ask you was about IBM and Watson, and you'd been pretty public about the, the fact that you were using Watson at GEICO. Uh, he wondered if your sale of IBM was related in any way to the performance of Watson. No, we, 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 we've been experimenting. There's a lot of possibilities uh, with the Watson at, at GEICO, and we've experimented with various different possibilities, and it's, so far it's done certain things and it hasn't done certain things. But that same kind of experimentation is going on at hospitals and going on, you know, it, and a whole bunch of areas. H&R Block uh, worked with it this year. And, uh, Watson is a pretty amazing invention. It has, and it is getting uh, put into use uh, a lot of places. And app writers are working on it. I mean, so it's it's a really interesting product, uh, and I'm sure the revenue is growing very significantly, but from a very small base. But I would say that you've got other very smart people. Uh, they've been given some time to work on other products. And I would say that when you get into that area, you, you do have to worry, uh, maybe even more than with the phone, you have to worry about somebody jumping the utility of something like that. Uh, where it really becomes valuable, uh, I mean, it's obviously valuable in being able to, to look at uh, x-rays and all that sort of thing much better and faster than humans can, and, and read all the literature, you know, uh, zillions of pages and all that. I would think the real, the biggest value will come in is when it actually replaces human labor. I mean, that is so quantifiable, and, and you know, machines don't uh, come around annually and ask for uh, higher wages, and they don't need they don't need health care, and I, they may need a little maintenance. But it, it if they replaced, if, if it should replace people in a big way, uh, it would have a lot of value unless somebody else has some other products to do the same thing. <laughs> so it's it's artificial intelligence, but it's it, it it's very much still in the artificial, emphasis on artificial in that. Yeah, not, I not think they call it something slightly different than that, yeah. but I, you and I, in a sort of common language, would call it artificial intelligence. And, and it is intelligent. Uh, the question is, is, uh, is how much better results can you get with it than using human beings, or how many human beings you can displace in getting it, or in, can you get some entirely new form of information that, that humans are actually incapable of getting because they can't keep every word that's been written about prostate cancer or something in their minds and, and have read everything up to what was published yesterday. Uh, so it, it, it's, I, I think it's got great potential. Uh, uh, it has not come as long, along as fast commercially as you would have hoped on, on that. It's probably growing at a very fast rate, but the base is probably fairly small, and there are people who are going to be chasing you. Okay. Uh, Andrew and Joe, we're, we're going to have much more with Mr. Buffett today, but right now we'll send it back to you um, for a quick update as well. Okay. Um, he, Warren hasn't seen any actual indications of any malevolent intent from Watson yet, has he? Mm -hmm. I mean, I. Just the idea of Watson controlling, like, what's going on in high... You know, I just remember what happened to those astronauts. You know what I mean? The ones that were actually yeah. in the... You know, he just slowly... Hal turns down all of the, uh, you know, life support. I mean, no... Have you seen that yet, Warren? That's what I worry about with, with Watson. I mean, does he seem I, like I, a nice guy? I, well, I've sat in the same room with him. Uh, for hours, and I kept an eye on him. <laughs> That's what I mean. You know, because no, uh, when they don't need us, why? why I mean, you just you said it. Health care. We ask for raises. We eat food. We, I mean, we're pretty super, you know, superfluous at, to, to some extent. And I just I don't trust Watson as far as I can throw him. And he's probably fairly large. Uh, I mean, the server, right? Well, we all know what happened with Hal 
in Space Odyssey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, actually, I've talked with some very smart people, not at IBM, just about the whole idea of artificial intelligence. I see them out in Sun Valley. They're, they're really smart. And, uh, you know, they all go different directions on this, but it, it's not, and not about Watson specifically, the whole subject of artificial intelligence. And, and uh, you've read about it, too, though. Uh, yeah. Know, I mean, they... Some people are worried. People, they're, they're genuinely worried. Uh, I'm just kidding. Are, some people are worried. Ge genuinely. Yeah. No, some I, people I'm, are worried. Uh, uh, down the road, really, we probably well, do got, need to think about it. You know, and... Um, Joe, I've got the cure for it. I got the cure for it. I'm 86. <laughs> <laughs> you won't worry as much under those circumstances. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it might be a far off. I, thank you for doing this, Warren. Your, your voice. We were just talking about what, a, what amazing... Uh, what you do for, for three or four days is like a superhuman almost. And uh, three or, and, three or yeah. four, three or four days a week, three or four days a year I work. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when I work, I make sure everybody's knowing and then I disappear. Yeah. Again, we are live with Warren Buffett this morning in his first sit down since speaking to the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders who made it here to Omaha this weekend, about 40,000 or so of them. Um, Warren, Joe just mentioned at the top that um, the markets are probably not all that surprised by the results with the French election. Yeah. Uh, Macron winning, Le Pen uh, going ahead and admitting defeat in this situation. When did you find out about the French situation? When did you hear about Le Pen uh, conceding? When did I hear about Le Pen the conceding? conceding, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have been pretty early. <laughs> so you, it, it wasn't something that you were necessarily... My no, point is no, it wasn't no, something I, you were sitting around no, waiting on. No, no, not, no, not in the least. No, you, I... I I can't think of when I've really done much about purchases or sales in connection with any election. I, I mean, every time, when I was a kid, every time a Democrat got elected, and like Roosevelt or anybody, you know, they, there was a wake in our house, and my father would start sh storing sugar in the basement or something like that. <laughs> so I have learned to <clears throat> not put too much weight in any given election. <laughs> This was not something. If if, the, if things had gone the other way, do you think the market reaction would have been um, as swift as some pundits had 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 anticipated? Well, it it might well have been, but uh, but people do get fooled on market uh, reactions, yeah. as, as we saw. Well, just when the Trump election went down a whole lot, and then came right back up in a matter of a few hours. So, uh, I don't think I'm any good at that. I mean, I. I I, there, there'd be a, people would be a lot faster if we if I was on the floor of, a, of an exchange. You know, I'd, I'd probably starve to death. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna make those knee-jerk reactions. No, I, investments. And, and it's. Uh, I mean, just think of all the events that have happened in 100 years or something, or even in the 75 years I've invested. And yeah. if, if I'd reacted to every one, I, my reaction percentage would would be terrible. I have a lot more in the way of costs, and I'd be out of the market. At times, I never really want to be out of the market. I, I, it isn't a question of being in the market. It's a question of owning businesses. And if I wanted to own farms, I wouldn't keep buying and selling them based on some election result or something like that. I don't, I'd own farms, and I'd try and figure out the best place to own them and get the best tenants I could on them and all of that sort of thing. So I look at businesses the same way. Let's talk about the U.S. economy, uh, because there have been a lot of questions about just how we're doing. We had that first quarter GDP number that came in um, with a really lousy 0.7 percent. Does this feel like a 0.7 percent economy to you? What do you see? Well, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't feel like one. I don't think it is one. <laughs> I, think, I think since the fall of 2009, and I think we've said this every time I've talked with you, it's more or less grown at a 2 percent rate. And I think deviations from that are as likely to be through problems in collecting the information or having the proper seasonal or by the fact that quarter to quarter they it's it's measured rather than over a year ago's quarter and so you multiply by four a change so a two tenths change becomes an eight tenth annual type figure and it i i do not look at those figures with a lot of Interest. I mean, obviously, when you get into the 2008 9 period and when the economy is falling apart, it's, it's a pretty good gauge of how fast it's falling apart compared to some earlier recession or something. But I have never done, I've never, I've never made a trade in a stock based on a GDP figure. Let's talk about the figures that you do pay attention to. And, and those are the, the numbers that you see coming back from the businesses you own outright or that you own major right. portions in, something like the railroads. Let's talk yeah. about what you're seeing right now. Well, railroad figures, which uh, I think the AAR puts them out on 
Wednesday. I got them Wednesday morning, and they show uh, 20 different categories, uh, plus intermodal. They show them by railroad. Uh, they show the Canadian roads. Uh, they show the short line roads. roads. And, and basically, uh, the economy uh, is doing okay. It's, uh, and when I say okay, I mean sort of the same 2% of rate. Now, the, it's not that precise for the rail figures, but one thing that's helped with rails is that natural gas has gone up in price. And there's a lot of coal that doesn't move at $2 natural gas that moves at $3 or 3 I mean, a lot. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, electric generation that they flip a switch, basically. And, and it's the input. And, and right now, natural gas is, I think, close to 325 on, on Friday. And that dictates the use of coal uh, a lot of places where if it was $2.25, they'd be running natural gas. So that's coal shipments are actually probably up the most percentage-wise of any of the 20 categories. Uh, they're certainly up most up dollar-wise. Uh, uh, on the other hand, petroleum products would be less. Grain is moving more this year. Uh, there's just a lot of crops still out there, and there's going to be more coming on. So uh, at the NSF, uh, we move 13,000 cars of grain, and they move at $33,000, $3,500 or something like that. So to get an extra 1,000 cars of grain, you got an extra $3 million of revenue. And, uh, but that's, that's a product of low prices for grain, so the farmers wanted to store more big crops. And we'll learn in the fall this year whether you have another big crop, and we'll carry a lot of grain if it happens, and if for some reason uh, there's a low crop, uh, it comes down. And they're just category crushed stone. I mean, you, you name them all. Well, one of the things that surprised me that I, I hadn't realized until we spoke with Matt Rose of BNSF this weekend is that the truckers, who I always thought of as the railroad's biggest competitor, didn't realize they're also their, their largest customer, that they're That's shipping true. so much for them. That's true. We carry a, a lot of trucks. It, 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 uh, you know, they load those babies on there and, and double stack them. And the, uh, uh, they are five biggest customers. I mean, you're, you've got, well, J.B. Hunt would be the biggest, but Schneider, which just went public here recently, uh, mm -hmm. those are big customers. I mean, they... They have a, an advantage just to start with it in, in loading in, in a, a huge percentage of ca uh, cases. But if you really are going to move heavy traffic, hundreds and hundreds of miles, bulk traffic, they're better off sticking them on a railroad than picking them up the other end. At, at Christmas time, uh, you know, with UPS or people like that, a lot of it will move by rail. Hmm. Uh, also, when it comes to housing, you've got a pretty good idea of what's happening there. Not only do you have a realtor company, you've got Acme Brick, Shaw Carpet, Clayton Homes, Benjamin Moore Paint. I was trying to think through all of the components yep. of housing. Uh, wh where do you see the housing market right now? It, it's getting better. I mean, it isn't booming, but both in, in resale of existing foam, homes, uh, Clayton Home Sales, that's, that's a manufactured home uh, product, uh, they're up significantly this year. We have three site-built builders with it. Clayton has started to go into that, uh, Kansas City and, 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 and Tennessee and, and Georgia, and, and they're all doing fine. Now, it's not boom time for any of these, but it's a lot better than it was three or four years ago, and it's better than it was last year, and I would anticipate that it continues to get better. Uh, it, it looks, there was this huge shift after 2008 and nine for people to rent rather than to buy. I mean, we, went, we had 69% we had home, home ownership, and I think it dropped to 63 or something of the sort. And, and there's some reasons why maybe it will stay lower. For one thing, when people bought houses in, in the early 2000s, they thought for almost for sure they could sell them to profit later on. So you had flippers or people that at least were convinced that they couldn't lose. Uh, people don't feel that way after what happened. And, and then any time you have a recession, it affects it affects matrimony and <laughs> a whole bunch of things, uh, but that's wearing off. And and home building is the, will be the best in this year, in my view, since since things went to hell in in two thousand eight. Millennials are actually starting to buy homes. 
Uh, yeah, and, and you know, I, I can't really get into specific age groups too well, but I, I see the aggregate figures, and uh, that's true. You know, brick sales will be better, and or at least they have been so far this year, and they were better last year, and uh, carpet. Now, people are changing their minds about what kind of uh, a covering they want for their floor. They're, they're going, going more to hardwood. And, uh, there, there's been some change uh, in preferences, but uh, when, when new home sales pick up, you know, flooring sales pick up, when houses change hands, paint picks up. Uh, there's, there's a big system there that, that, that feeds, and we see improvement. We're not seeing boom times or anything, but, but you can get some feeling for that part of the economy. And, and we've got 80-plus auto dealerships, and you, you would know what was going on on that anyway because the car companies report so frequently as uh, unit sales. But the economy's getting better. The economy was, the economy was, has been getting better since 2009. In terms of what you see from the industrial side of things, you've got Marmon, IMC. I, I just think through a lot of industrial areas, too. Have you seen a pickup in that part of the business? Well, that was slow uh, up to recent. But I, we saw a fair uptick, not huge, but, but, but noticeable, in March. Uh, and uh, we'll see how much carry through there is to that. Uh, the industrial stuff, in many cases, uh, went into the energy, oil and gas business. So the slowdown in oil and gas affected a, a lot of different types of industrial activity. I mean, it, it, it backs up through, through uh, a lot of equipment. Uh, so it was definitely affected by that. Uh, but the most recent figures would be encouraging but incomplete. I, I'd like to just ask you, we talk all the time about the animal spirits that started moving. You saw the stock market run up after Donald Trump's election. Does that show up in your numbers anywhere? We, animal spirits are, the, are, are, shortened, are shorthand for saying, yeah, people got more optimistic, businesses got more optimistic, uh, consumer confidence rose, the stock market rose. Does that show up in the sales line? Well, it certainly shows up. I mean, if you look at, at, at charge card, uh, in the first quarter with Visa, American Express, uh, you name it. I mean, get those figures. Uh, they got, they were, they were quite strong uh, and got stronger in March. So, uh, and those are big numbers. I mean, people charge lots of stuff on, on, on credit cards. And if you, American Express lost the Costco account, so you're not comparing apples to apples there. But, but if you make adjustment for that, and incidentally, that was around the world. And I think, the, I mean, these figures are announced by American Express, so I'm not telling anything new. But the UK was up 17.5% for American Express. Well, you know, American Express has been around a while. They were, they were, they were up 15% in Japan. I'm talking local currency. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, and, and the US was, was very good, better than I anticipated. And it got better through the quarter. And certainly. Uh, through the first quarter or the fourth quarter? The first quarter, first quarter, yeah. first quarter. and uh, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase is doing very well with their card, and uh, I just think as you see, uh, I mean, you can see what the consumer is doing. Credit card volume is, will tell you a lot about the consumer, what uh, what what their attitude is. Do you see that showing up at your consumer businesses too, in the stores at Nebraska Furniture Mart, at Seas Candy, at Dairy Queen? How does it kind of play out? They're doing well, but. The, 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 uh, the, the furniture mart, and we have other furniture stores. I mean, we have them in, in, in with R.C. Willie in the West, and we have it uh, with Jordans in Boston. And, uh, oh, there's, they show decent gains. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to have much more from Warren. And by the guy, way, guys, if you want to jump in, feel free to do that. But uh, we're going to have much more from him coming up. We still have to talk to him about 3G and the political environment and uh, airlines and some of the controversy that's happened there. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everybody. We are live in Omaha, Nebraska, with Berkshire Hathaway's chairman and CEO, Warren Buffett, who is sitting down with us for his first interview since speaking to the Berkshire faithful who made their way here, about 40,000 shareholders who were here uh, in Omaha over the weekend. And, and Warren, thank you again for sitting down with us this morning. Uh, thanks for coming out. 
there were a lot of questions that were brought up by shareholders this weekend, and, and, and some of them had to do with 3G, um, the private investment firm that you all have been so active with in a lot of different ways. Uh, it, it's not new controversy. It's been issues that have been brought up because 3G operates a little differently when it buys a business than than, than you have when you've bought a, di a business in the past. They're all about operations and, and getting things streamlined very quickly. Usually when you buy a business, you, you like to have the management there, you keep the management, and you let things continue to run. Um, but it, it, it did bring some questions in, again, from shareholders this year, including questions about how politically savvy it is to be doing working doing business with a company that's going to be laying off uh, employees in this political environment uh, with this president who has said he is very much in favor of protecting American jobs. How, how do you respond to that? Well, it, 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 it does get a political response, and it varies depending on who's president or how much attention the particular layoff gets or whatever it may be. Uh, uh, you know, if, if, if we had not changed any ways we did business, we would be living as we lived in 1776. I mean, productivity gains are the only way that consumption gains come. If, if productivity per capita stays the same, consumption per capita stays the same. Uh, and fortunately, over a couple hundred years, uh, in farming, for example, we literally came up with tools, we, we came up, we got rid of the horses and had tractors, we came up with better seed, better fertilizer, all of those things. So whereas 80 percent of the people had to be working on farms just to feed the country uh, a couple hundred years ago, we now have less than 3 percent. And that means 97 percent of people can turn out other things that you want. Uh, so productivity, everybody understands productivity gains are the key to living better. But when they happen to you, very understandably, uh, you feel that you're getting the short end of the stick. Society may be benefiting, but you're getting hurt. And we've always, we, we tried buying, buying a few businesses that had troubles and all of that, and it wasn't any fun uh, eventually getting rid of 2,000 people working at, 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 uh, at Berkshire's textile mills or, or at other businesses we, we were in. So we've tried at Berkshire to buy businesses that are already very productive. And, and keep them that way, and or they have their managers keep them that way. 3G has come into businesses where they really could do the same level of business with a lot fewer people. And they've made the changes very promptly when it happens, and they've been good about severance pay and all of that. But they have followed the standard capitalist formula, market system formula, of trying to do business with fewer people. And, and that, that benefits everybody, it particularly benefits the owner. Uh, but it's a painful process, and sometimes there's a big political reaction to it. Uh, Geico, which now employs 36,000 people in the early 1970s, or right after a fellow named Jack Byrne came in who cleaned up the problem, uh, cut almost half of its employees. I mean, it got rid of thousands of people, and it was painful. It was because of a management mistake. The people that got laid off, uh, no fault of their own at all. They just Geico management had come up with the wrong prices, and, and they were losing money, they were going to go bankrupt. And a fellow named Jack Byrne came in, and he saved the company, but in the process of saving the company, he laid off thousands of people, and he had to lay them off promptly. So uh, there will be readjustment. Well, the railroad industry, after World War II, has something like 1.6 million people working in it now. It has less than 200,000 now, from 1.6 million down to 200,000. And it's carrying considerably more freight than it was at that time. Now, it's true there was a passenger factor then. But the, mm -hmm. the improvement in productivity has been dramatic. Otherwise, the railroad business, there wouldn't be any railroad business if it was existing like it did in 1946. But you are, if you're, that's easy to talk about. But it, it's the same problem as trade. Trade benefits people in invisible and small ways, and to the person who puts out a business who spent 25 years learning a trade as a steel worker or as a manufacturer of shoes, it, it is a disaster. And a rich country, and we're ungodly rich as a country, 57 or 58,000 of GDP per capita, we have to take care of people who, who, who are the roadkill in better output for all the rest of us. And, and, and I don't blame anybody for voting against a system that they think is, is bypassing them and just and throwing them aside. Because if you're a 55-year-old steel worker or a 55-year-old shoe manufacturer, 
you are not going to earn a new trade, and you know, you're not going to have another job that's good. And yeah, society has to take care of them because it's achieving a societal objective, which is to get more output per capita. Okay. Andrew has a question on this as well. Andrew? Hey, Warren. Uh, to the extent that 3G is successful at using its, its zero-based budgeting to, to wring more efficiencies out of the companies that it owns, how much pressure do you think it's going to put on other units of Berkshire or companies that Berkshire owns, for example, Coca-Cola, which may have to follow the same type of model to, to keep the same type of margins, get, given the success that 3G may ultimately have? Yeah, James Quincy, the, uh, the uh, new <clears throat> CEO of, of uh, Coca-Cola, or designated new CEO, uh, has already said that uh, there'll be 1,200 jobs uh, reduced at headquarters at Coca-Cola. Now, Coca-Cola has been a very, very, very profitable company over the years and uh, could afford to have lots of people around who aren't really changing productivity that much. But uh, volume has leveled off more or less. Uh, but I would argue that even if it was prosperous, it shouldn't have more people doing it than are needed. I mean, that is, that's the guts of of capitalism is you don't have a lot of people doing something when fewer people can get the job done. You free those people up to work in other areas and innovate for them so that they bring out new products and people live better when there's more output per capita. So you, you don't gain anything by having thousands of people around. You can afford to do it in some cases, but, but Coca-Cola is uh, doing exactly the right thing if they, if they look at their operation and say, how many people do we need to do the job right? And if you're very prosperous, the cigarette companies were this way in the, in, in the past. I mean, they, they were so prosperous, it really didn't make any difference. Uh, I forget uh, the name of the fellow that flew around with his, sent the airplanes for his dogs and all of that sort of <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and they could afford yeah. to do it. But, but that output for America, you know, goes down when that plane flies around with a dog in it. <laughs> and, uh, and prosperous companies tend to be sloppier than if companies that are in tougher businesses. You're forced to think harder. And packaged goods generally has been a very pr profitable business. I mean, if you look at the, the great companies in that field, for decades and decades and decades, they earned high returns on capital. And so you probably found more sloppiness in employment than you would find if you ran a very tough retail business like my grandfather's grocery store. You just couldn't afford it. <laughs> Do you still like these companies where you see the margins coming down pretty significantly uh, in, in industries like consumer packaged goods, companies like Coca-Cola, like Kraft? You, you've got major investments in these areas. Well, Kraft, the margins have come up because yeah. they've... They, they, uh, because they, of they're doing just as much business. Yeah. Uh, but it, they're not... They don't, they, they don't have people there that they don't need. And, and Coca-Cola, uh, James Quincy, has announced 1,200 people in headquarters. I will... I will guarantee you they won't sell us Coca-Cola because those 1,200 people are gone. I mean, it, 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 and uh, we have in Berkshire's businesses, some of them, a certain amount of slop. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't we don't drive it as hard as we could, but that's that's no tribute to me. It just means I don't. That isn't something I like spending my time on. I don't like a lot of inefficiencies, and and so, some of our companies are extremely efficient, but it is they are not as efficient as if to, to feed myself tonight, I had to have them running at maximum efficiency. But that, that, that's a defect of mine. I mean, that is, that's something to brag about. Uh, let's get back to Becky, who is in Omaha uh, this morning following the Berkshire Hathaway uh, annual meeting. And she's joined by none other than Warren Buffett this morning, who, Becky, you don't need uh, like to know about a company, you don't necessarily have to use their, their products and stuff. I, I'm just thinking about, you know, Warren opining on, on the airline uh, industry. You, like, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, I mean, oh, I, I, th I, I thought I, you were talking about Apple because he doesn't have an iPhone or either. Apple, or <laughs> Apple, but, uh, you know, I love to hear his comments on the airline industry because, you know, friends have been telling him about what it's like uh, to be at a, one of those airports and stuff. And, <laughs> You would walk on and you'd be like the kid, the rich kid that says, who are these other people, Dad, uh, when they finally fly on a... <laughs> you have no idea, Buffett. I mean, don't pretend to... Uh, so so you, you've read up on it, I guess, right? Is that... That's about the extent of it. I, I would make a small bet, Joe, that I have taken more commercial airline 
Well, you're um, 86 Feinstein. or 87. You, okay. Yeah, All right. right. <laughs> okay. All right. You've taken more breaths than me, too. That's that's not going to do it, boy. That's not going to. Uh, I always okay, say that. Okay, I see I, <laughs> the last movie you saw no, in I, flight I, was I, was a was a, it just come out? It was Casablanca. That was the last movie you saw on an in flight no. uh, commercial, huh? I I saw Sully the other day while riding on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this is about a plane that goes down. Uh, so I didn't, but I, I have to admit it was not a commercial plane. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Warren, Warren, let's shift gears here. We were going to talk about something else, but let's talk airlines right sure. here since Joe just gave us that great entree yeah, point right. to it. <laughs> sort of an easy answer. Exactly. Like, answer this now, following up. Um, <laughs> you are, through Berkshire, the largest investor in, in four major airlines. Correct. A, including United. And we have seen the troubles at United. We haven't really gotten the chance to talk to you too much about that. W what did you think, as the largest shareholder, when you saw the video of Dr. David Dow being dragged off and then the response from Oscar Munoz, who was uh, called in front of Congress last week to testify on yeah. this, along with some other airline CEOs. Obviously, it's a terrible mistake. And you actually stated that, you know, I, I, I saw the event with the fellow being dragged off and then the response. I, I, I kind of wonder whether Oscar had actually seen that when he made the response. If so, it was a bigger mistake uh, by far than if he hadn't seen it. I mean, I, uh, and I don't know the answer to that, but, but the, the natural tendency, if you've got 80,000 employees and you hear about some incident, is to defend your employees, but it wouldn't be your natural tendency if you'd <laughs> seen, a, seen the uh, tape. So I don't know precisely. In either case, it was a mistake. In one case, it was an egregious mistake. Uh, and, uh, you know, He's, he's apologized many times, but your first reaction is is going to get a lot of attention. Yeah, I, I understand what you're pointing to. Like United has had some employees that have been unhappy since the merger. They've had some issues, some legacy issues, and things they've been trying to deal with. He has been concerned about trying to make sure that the employees feel good about things. Um, but again, um, that video and that tone deaf response made a lot of people feel like. Uh, they have forgotten that these are customers, paying it's a customers. Killer. No, I mean, and, and, and uh, uh, I worry about that with 367,000 employees as well. Uh, it, if somebody stands on their feet all day selling candy and people are yelling at them and, you know, it's Valentine's Day and they, they're trying like crazy to keep up. There'll be certain people that may blow up, you know, <laughs> late in the day. And, I mean, we have a... Actually, some of them just walk off the job. They just get tired of it. You know? Really? And, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, what really gets them is that we hire lots of temporary help, obviously, at, at holidays. Mm -hmm. And the customers know more about the product than the people we hire. I mean, we, we'll hire people and we'll just have 100 different pieces and maybe educate them a little. But the customer's been coming in for 30 years. And it, that, that psychologically, it's hard to handle when the customer starts telling you, you don't know what you're doing, you know. And, and so... A certain number of people may behave badly, and, and what you hope is they don't behave real badly, and not too many people do it. But we will have we'll have somebody do something. We'll have more than one somebody uh, do something. If we have thousands and thousands of retail transactions, for example, some people don't follow the rules. We had an accident, you know, here a while back on, on the railroad that somebody didn't follow the rules, and and. There, the penalty is huge, I mean, in terms of injuries and so on. Uh, uh, you do the best you can on it. Yeah. At, uh, you know, the first report I get from Matt Rose every quarter, the first topic is safety. The, the head of BNSF. Uh, the head of BNSF, the first report is safety. And, and, and the injuries have been driven down and down, but he says he's not happy until they get to zero. Well, I know that's what he wants to do, but you can't get them to zero. At, uh, uh, but... You, you really, you want people to be treating everybody they meet in business as if it's the person they love the most. I mean, I, at, at Geico, we got thousands of people on the phone and they're just getting calls all the time. And I, I like them to have a picture of whomever they love the most, you know, it can be their mother, their wife, their dog, <laughs> whatever it is, be talking to that person because it really comes through. You know, you mentioned that on 
Valentine's Day, maybe you have somebody on their feet all day, they get fed up and maybe they walk off the job. You can understand why airline employees get frustrated because everybody in the airport is mad because conditions in the airport, getting through TSA, and then, frankly, what the airlines have done themselves with their own policies, where you're charging people for bags, you're cramming people in with less and less leg room. Um, it, it, it's become very commoditized, making the people feel like maybe more like cattle than like customers yeah. coming through here. But part of that, the airlines are responsible for. Not all of it, for oh, sure. I understand. Not all of it. But the yeah. airlines themselves have created some of those yeah. situations. One of the things they found is that a very high percentage of people are very price conscious. So. Uh, you know, they, they may become like cattle cars, but people would rather be treated like a significant per percentage would rather be treated that way and and fly for X than have far more leg room and more, you know, two of us, <laughs> all kinds of things and, and travel for X plus 25 percent. So to some extent, they try to segment. segment have, uh, have they pushed a little too far to, along those lines? Well, if so, the, the customer will tell them. You know, basically by flying. You know, uh, and, and well, the, but, the, the customer would tell them by flying somewhere else. But the problem is with airlines, you often don't have a choice. Often don't it, have it, a choice. More than seventy percent of the airlines or the flights that are originated out of Newark are United Airline flights. I, I don't have a choice when no. I when that's my home. Yeah, my home place to go. But, but some people, I mean, we suggested to people actually that came to the Berkshire meeting because the prices went up a lot. The demand went up a lot. They put on thousands and thousands and thousands of extra seats. The airlines told me. So I actually put in the annual report every year, you can fly to Kansas City during the annual meeting time way cheaper than you can fly to Omaha, and you can rent a car there and be here in a couple of hours. And uh, a fair number of people actually do that, you know, that, but a lot of people don't. I mean, it, it, people have different preferences, but there's no question. I mean, I would hate to run an airline. Mm -hmm. uh, people are traveling. They're hoping to make a wedding. They're hoping to make a business appointment. It's important to them. It is. It is. <laughs> and, and I understand all of those issues. I, I guess I'm asking you, as the largest shareholder, it sounds like you have not had any conversations with Oscar Munoz. Uh, I've, since I've never any met him or talked to him. So I, I'm asking you if it concerns you when reactions like this get the heads of these airlines called up in front of Congress. It's bad. Would that potentially change the investment strategy? It, 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 it wouldn't change the investment strategy. It's bad. I mean, not how bad it is. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, but there is no way. That you aren't going to read about some airline incidents. Now, the one thing going for the airlines is they've become unbelievably safe. I mean, I never would yeah. have dreamt. Uh, but they have also worked toward having higher load factors. Uh, when they have load factors in the, you know, like they did in the past around 70, I mean, they, they don't want bankrupt. <laughs> and they need high load factors, and high load factors mean a fair amount of discomfort and. Uh, it has kept prices from going up, but as you point out, I, I have not written a commercial airline for as a long Joe time. As Joe points out, not me. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it, it's a job I don't want, <laughs> running an airline. Right. Um, I, I guess the only question is, do you think Congress would do anything that would make your investment less worthwhile? They could. Uh, I don't think it, they will, likely. But the interesting thing about it is, if, if you regulated the airlines, mm -hmm. re-regulated them, uh, you would have, uh, well, you, whatever they decide to regulate, but you could have, you could have more leg space, you could have, uh, you could have no overbooking, you could, I mean, you, right. you can regulate all kinds of things. The cost will go up, right. and, and, and that's the trade-off. Andrew, you had a question, too? Uh, in a similar, similar vein, uh, Warren, I had actually two questions. One relates to just whether you think Forgetting about regulating the airlines per se, but just the idea that at least in certain markets you could see some pressure to open up more slots or effectively to take slots from different airlines and try to give them to others. What you think the risk is to the investment thesis from that perspective? Yeah. Well, if you get more more planes around, call it seat miles, too many seat miles around. Uh, it, be, it just gets to be brutal. I mean, they all went broke. Uh, if you put in bankruptcy and airlines in the search, you'll, you'll see, you'll see in 100 names or thereabouts just in the last 30 years, and you'll see, you know, all the big names. You won't see Southwest or uh, Alaska, but you'll see the big names. I mean, it, it's a brutal business because the incremental cost of one extra person in an empty seat is practically nothing. 
And the problem you have is keeping the pricing of that incremental seat from infecting all of the seats on the plane. And everybody knows the prices every day. So it, 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 there's, no, there's no way to dress it up or anything of the sort. There's ways of offering different combinations, like whether you charge for this or that. And, and some people like that and some people don't like it. Everything you do, though, uh, your, your competition uh, can uh, copy. Now, Becky mentions a point. If you've got enough of the gates at a given airline, then you have some protection as long as people want to fly from there. But people travel to other airports, too, under those circumstances. It is, it's a very, very uh, tough business. If you want one figure that really counts in determining how well the airlines are going to work economically, it's going to be, it's going to be the uh, percentage of seat occupancy, basically. Uh, uh, I was a director uh, of U.S. Air. It was a really dumb investment on my part. And I made it all by myself. I didn't even consult Charlie. And by the time the ink was drying, I knew it was dumb. And then it got dumber. And that airline actually went broke twice. Fortunately, there was a blip in between, and we, we actually made a pretty fair profit out of the stock, but we didn't deserve it. And it, it went broke twice. And they would have a route like, and I'm pulling this out of the air, obviously, but, you know, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, or something like that. And as long as they were the dominant carrier with a lot of gates at each end, they did fine. And then Southwest or somebody would come in, and they would look at 14 cents a seat mile and uh, revenue mile, and, and then, you know, they could do it for 12 cents. And, and a big enough price differential moved people all over. And, of course, the, the industry is looking for all kinds of things through loyalty points and all that to make it stickier. But in the truth, uh, when people are going to fly from X to Y, they can go to their computer and figure, figure out very quickly how much it's going to cost them. And, and it's, a tough, it's a tough business. It was a suicidal business for a long time. Having the consolidation that came about through the bankruptcies has made it an extremely competitive business. I don't think it's a suicidal business anymore. But if they get down to running at 70% of capacity or something like that, it'll be suicidal again. <laughs> Andrew, Warren, you had a follow-up on that? Yeah, Warren, real quick. The, the other thing I was curious about is um, many of the U.S. airlines have lobbied uh, the Trump administration and have lobbied other Washington lawmakers um, against uh, part of the Open Skies Agreement, uh, arguing that um, a number of the Middle Eastern uh, airlines, uh, like Emirates, have effectively been subsidized in dumping their services in the United States um, at prices that are below what it truly costs them, about a $50 billion subsidy they've described. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? What do you think should happen if that's true? I, I don't know the facts on it, but I, but I would say that over the years there's been a fair amount of below cost pricing, and anytime you're in a business where your competitor is uh, is getting into below cost pricing, and there's not huge difference in the public's minds between flying airline A or airline B. The timing of their departures and all that and rivals may make some difference, but people are very price sensitive. And uh, if people are pricing below cost, at, when I was on the board of U.S. Air, we had a lot of planes out in the desert. And if you get a lot of planes out of the desert, you've got problems. And so I, and I would say that if you, uh, uh, you, sh you should try to figure out the best system for having reliable, safe planes operating. It's better if they're overall operating profitably than if they're operating at a loss, because if they're operating at a loss, you're going to have a bankruptcy situation, and you're going to have to redo union contracts and all sorts of things like that. Incidentally, one other factor in the airline industry currently is, I mean, you really do have a, a, a pilot shortage to some degree, and pilots come in from the military, and they're just not coming in as much. What does that mean? Well, it just means that that the pilot pilot union has gained some strength <laughs> relatively, and and uh, now there are differentials as you work for the smaller uh, airlines and all of that. But if, if if you're if you're running a big airline, one of the things on your list of things to worry about is, is labor costs going up, and, and and you need experienced pilots. I mean, you have high requirements of hours. Uh, for those people to be in the in those seats. We're going to have much more coming up with Warren Buffett.
Welcome back to Squawk Box, everyone. We are live this morning in Omaha, Nebraska, with Berkshire Hathaway's chairman and CEO, Warren Buffett. He's been sitting down with us, going through a lot of issues. Uh, this is his first interview since talking to the 40,000 or so Berkshire shareholders who showed up here in Omaha this weekend. Warren, one of the items that came up with a little bit of controversy over the weekend was Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first question that was posed to you uh, from, a sh from a shareholder. Uh, and the questions, a lot of them came in, and they were all kind of were related to what you thought about Wells Fargo. Now, in the past, you've run that uh, that clip from your congressional hearings over Solomon Brothers, and, 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 and the very famous clip is where you say, lose money for the firm and I will be understanding, lose a shred of reputation for the firm, and I will be ruthless. I did have one shareholder who wrote in a question asking why you weren't ruthless when it came to Wells Fargo. Well. The CEO lost his job and gave back his pay. So, I, and I was not a director. So, I mean, I would say that the CEO feels that his life has been an important way ruined. I mean, and and, uh, and incidentally, I, I don't. I, I know John Stump. I don't think it had anything to do with him making money. Uh, but I, and I, and I don't know what happened because I, I, I maybe would talk to him once a year or something of the sort. And uh, but they obviously came up. With an incentive system that incented the wrong things. Now, most businesses do that from time to time. We've, we've done it at various businesses. I mean, you you think you've come up with a brilliant idea, <laughs> and then you find out that it gets. You, it's probably happened in your family. I mean, you know, in terms of what deciding what allowance to give or what uh, you know things. Not everything works out as you anticipate. That's okay, but you, you get signals back that it isn't working, and you got to stop it. The big mistake was whenever sufficient information had come back that this is producing a counterproductive effect. It's not resulting in more cross-selling, it's resulting in all kinds of games being played and phony accounts and all that sort of stuff. That's the moment of truth. I mean, that is, that's the big uh, moment, because you have to stop it then. And you just got to say, what's wrong with the system and how do we correct it? And believe me, that happens at Berkshire, that happens every place. Uh, if you don't do it immediately, uh, and you let it run for a while, now you've got the ultimate problem because you, everybody that comes in says, well, yeah, but why didn't you do this when you first heard about it? So that is the key time. Um, and and you, we have a hotline. We have about 4,000 uh, complaints of one sort or another that come in on the hotline. All, everybody that works for Berkshire has access to it. It comes into Omaha. Uh, most are frivolous, you know. The person next to me has bad breath or something like that. Well, they've got to work that one out on their own. Some of them, a good many of them, should go back to the human relations departments of the companies. And uh, now, if they don't do the proper thing, then we then we have to do something about it. But ma ma mainly, they're, they're things that are at that level. And then a few are really, really important. And they're they, they're anonymous, and there's no retribution. And you would certainly think that in any big bank, including Wells Fargo or any big institution of any kind, the hotline is bringing in lots of information. And whoever is in charge of that now, at our place, it's the head of internal audit, but it can be the general counsel. It can be, there, there should be people looking at that, and they should be deciding which to send back to subsidiaries, but they should be deciding which one should go to the CEO. And I've, I've had a reasonable number of actions that came to me either through the hotline or anonymous letters to me. And you can, you can tell when it might be something serious. We've spent a lot of money investigating the things that come in like that because we turn it over to an outside person frequently. And a pretty percentage, a good percentage of the time, it led to something pretty big. And they, at Wells Fargo, you know that some stuff was coming up for the branches and people. And, Somebody didn't pay any attention to it. And then if you wait a year, you know, it, it, it's just totally bad news. Have you lost confidence in the bank as a result? Do you think the bank's reputation has suffered as a result? And would you ever sh sell any shares yeah. as a result? Well, the reputation has been hurt. Uh, the fundamental earning power of the bank over a period of years has not been hurt in any material way. But, but the reputation of the bank has, has been hurt. Uh, I would argue probably that better systems would be in place there now, just like they were at Solomon, uh, than probably exist at most of the competitors. I mean, uh, and that's true when other banks get slammed down on 
whether it's mortgage things or some trading thing. I mean, that, that, that does focus the mind, and it focuses the directors, it focuses the media. So, in general, I would bet on the practices being better in any operation that's had that kind of attack and scrutiny and deserved attack and scrutiny than it might be if you were just kind of sailing along thinking everything. I worry about getting complacent. Mm -hmm. uh, Warren, we're going to take a quick break. Warren, we have been sitting down and talking with you for the last hour and a half, which has been wonderful, and I haven't pushed you on this yet, but this is something you spent a little time talking about at the annual meeting this weekend. Probably the question that, that we get from, from viewers and from shareholders more than any other is where do you think the market is headed and what do you think of market valuations right now? Um, it, it's not something that you often comment on in depth, but this weekend you did talk a little bit about how it's getting harder and harder to find deals, how um, there are a number of factors that have certainly driven up the price of businesses. Can you tell us wh what's happening right now, uh, yeah. what, what's going on? Well, the first part, where the market's headed, I don't know. It'll, it'll be higher 10 years from now, it'll be higher 20 years from now, it'll be higher 30 years from now, but I have no idea what the market will do in the short term. It, 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 if I thought it was a productive area of ex exploration, I'd do it, but I, uh, I don't know how to do it. My partner, Charlie Munger, doesn't know how to do it. Uh, so we think about businesses. Now, unfortunately, right now, the, the largest, quote, business, end quote, we own, uh, we've got about $95 billion in, and it's selling at 100 times earnings, and the earnings can't go up, which sounds like a pretty dumb investment, and it is. Uh, but that's what we get on Treasury bills, basically. And uh, uh, we literally have... have, have it's not all in bills, but we have 95 in cash, mostly bills, and we are paying 100 times earnings for something like I say, whose earnings can't go up if you get 1%. And that does not make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to buy businesses. Uh, we will buy businesses, but it makes it much tougher uh, when there's 1% money around and the people who, many of the people who buy businesses use as much borrowed money as they can. and when they get that at rates that are based off that very low rate of 1%, uh, they can pay a lot more money than we can uh, using what we, pretty much all equity money, because that's the way we look at money. So, so we have not made uh, significant acquisition now for 15 months or thereabouts. And You're getting a little itchy? Oh, I'm always, I, I, if, I, if it goes for 15 minutes, I get itchy. <laughs> but I can't afford to give in to the fact that I can't scratch. Yeah. <laughs> I get in big trouble. Uh, you know, once you buy a business, the business doesn't know what you paid for it. So it is not going to earn some appropriate amount just because you paid export. And if you do something dumb going in, either in terms of the kind of business you buy or the price you pay for a perfectly decent business, uh, the results are with you forever. So. It's my job to allocate capital, and it's a very tough period in which to allocate capital. But that's okay. It makes a game. That's why I come to work every day. You did say over the weekend that if the C's Candy uh, seller had tried to get $5 million more from you, you would have said no and walked away, and that would have been a mistake. Are you still that cheap? Uh, no, I'm not as cheap, because that taught me something. I'm still cheap, but, <laughs> but, but not, as, not as cheap as I used to be. And, and uh, Charlie saved us on that one. Uh, uh, the seller saved us because he did come down, but Charlie, Charlie also was, was pushing me somewhat. And you can afford to overpay a bit for a really fine business, depending on your degree of certainty that it's a really fine business and it's going to stay one for a long, long time. And you can't make that decision about most businesses. I mean, it, it's just not given to man to be able to foresee 20 years out on, on most businesses. Uh, on the other hand, if you pay big prices for something, you're counting on earnings. Uh, you're counting on being right a very high percentage of the time on, on projections of earnings that go up. And, of course, the best kind of earnings are the ones that go up without more capital investment. It's very easy to have great earnings in the utility business. You just put a slug of money in and you get a return out of it. The return isn't that great. So you're really looking for something that will uh, grow. And, uh, and I, I did mention one thing at the meeting, which I don't think people appreciate at all, is if you take, say, the five largest businesses in the country by market value, you're probably, and assuming Berkshire isn't in there, it flips in and flips out, let's assume we're out. Those five businesses have a market value of two and a half trillion or more, you know, mm -hmm. starting with Apple. Uh, 
you could run those five businesses with no equity capital. So you have close to 10% of the market value, perhaps, of the United States in five extremely good businesses that essentially take no capital. Now, that was not the case in the past. I mean, if you were at the turn of the century and you were talking about U.S. Steel and, and the big railroads and all that, you made large sums or Rockefeller with the oil business by earning money with refineries or, 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 or steel mills and finally you earned enough so that you bought another one and you borrowed some money along the way, but you had to build up equity capital dramatically as you went along. And even if you go back to the Fortune 500 of 30 years ago, the companies that, that were big took big capital. Now you've got the five highest valued companies in the country, they don't take any capital. Even IBM uh, has net no tangible assets. And if you take the equity, gap equity, subtract the intangible assets, it's, it's less than zero. And if you take businesses, you know, you, t you take a Google, uh, I mean, they may, they may invest some money in fixed assets and all, but they actually need no equity capital. So you could have a two and a half trillion dollar business in the United States and not need equity capital. And that is a different world than the past. You, over the years, over the last 10 or 15 years, have become a much more industrialized companies, things like the railroads that do require more capital equipment, more capital investment. When did you notice um, that the top five market, share, market cap companies required no capital investment? When did you make this realization? And does that explain your investment in Apple? It doesn't explain it. I, I, I've understood that for a long time, but it's become more and more concentrated. It used to be Exxon Mobil up there, and some. Uh, so the shift has been taking place, and essentially, the great, great, great businesses have become businesses that don't take capital, and, and that really wasn't true. I mean, the auto industry took a lot of capital. The aerospace industry took a lot of capital. The railroad industry. These are huge industries that affected America. I mean, they they changed our country. Now you've got companies that have huge market values changing the country. They don't take any money. Uh, those companies, for the way, for people who are listening on radio, we did just show a chart of that, but, or a, a full screen of it. It's Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and who am I leaving out? And uh, Facebook. Facebook, maybe. right, yeah. and Facebook. Those are the five. Um, and Alphabet, obviously, the parent company of Google. Um, that's... That's a huge shift. Would you like Berkshire's businesses to be more reflective of that sort of new paradigm? I love it. I just <laughs> wasn't able to build. I, I got seized candy and I haven't had one since. I don't quite <laughs> like that. I've got, we've got a few. But uh, those are the wonderful businesses. The, the businesses that grow and don't require money. And of course, that's why they're awash in cash. And to the extent they made it abroad, some of it they'd have to pay some tax if they brought it back. Now. They use some capital. I mean, they, they build headquarters and they have small amounts of inventory in some cases. Research already. and development for but, some of these issues. But if you took, you don't need it. Absolutely. I, I could run those businesses and they, I mean, they could run them a lot better with absolutely no equity capital. In fact, a huge negative equity capital. You can't run ExxonMobil with, with ne negative capital. You, know, you can't run U.S. Steel. You can't run the railroads. You can't run the utilities. All these massive industries that really what the country was built on up till not that many years ago. And now there's this huge shift to intangibles. And they produce products that people love. So I, I, I'm not saying this is in any way you know, frivolous or anything of the sort that it happened this way. But it makes a big difference when people talk about capital shortages and how we need you know, to bring the money back. Because the, the, there's a whole bunch of things that are sort of built, built on this conception of how business was 50 years ago. And sometimes it's useful for the people in those businesses <laughs> to sort of play up that fact and not what really has happened in the way of change. But it is a big change. You're, you're talking also about the shift away from an industrial um, economy, uh, away yeah, it, from uh, more towards services, more towards blue collar or white collar jobs in many of these instances, too. But, and if you can find businesses that don't take capital and are going to earn a lot of money, that's how you can become rich very easily and very early. Now, this is so easy to come up with it, but you can get the capitalized value of something and nobody says, yeah, but it's going to take $100 billion to build it. I mean, if Google had come along and the infrastructure required would have taken $100 billion, you know, that, that would be a different situation. In fact, Jeff Bezos has talked about that in Amazon. He said, look, at, with Amazon, he said, we needed the Internet. Somebody else spent 
billions of dollars developing it, but it wouldn't have worked without the internet. He said we needed transportation. Somebody else had already built the railroads and UPS and all of that sort of thing. And he, see, he said we needed payment systems. That would take billions of dollars to build, but that had already been done by Visa and all along the line. So he took three huge requirements where the other guys had spent the money, and then he combined them in a way that he didn't have to spend the money. You have and talked, it's brilliant. I give him great credit you, for you, it. You have talked extensively over the last several days, even the last several months, about how Jeff Bezos is the best business leader you think we have right now in the United States, about how Amazon is a brilliant company. Um, and now you're talking about how it's one of five companies that take no capital to continue to build. How come you don't buy shares of Amazon? Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, w I was impressed with Jeff early. I never thought he could pull off what he did. And what's really, I, I mean, I thought he could pull off something, but, but on the scale that, that has happened, I mean, it's changed your behavior, you know, it's, it's changed everybody in the office's behavior. And the remarkable thing about Jeff uh, and everything else is he's, a, he's done it in two inter industries almost simultaneously that really don't have that much connection. I've never seen any person develop two really important industries at the same time and really be the operational guy in both. And he's done a good job with the Washington Post on the side, just on it personally. But, but here you take cloud services. I mean, he, and there was a Charlie Rose show on this uh, that he did three or four months ago. He thought he would have two years of runway. He got seven years. You do not want to give Jeff Bezos a seven year head start. Before the competitors in, jumped in, in any on cloud services. Race. So at the same time he's, develop, he's, he's shaking up the whole retail world, He's also shaking up the IT <laughs> world simultaneously, and, and uh, you know, I take my hat off to him. But by not buying shares right now, it suggests that you think maybe they're too rich, or, or is it that you don't understand the company's valuation? Uh, uh, it, it's a big valuation. It, it's very hard when you thought about something at one-tenth the price to buy a ten. We, we do it occasionally. And, you know, you're, you're talking now about getting multiples from the hundreds of billions, and uh, but if you if you told me that you were going to shoot me at the end of ten years, if 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 uh, a short worked out better than a long, I mean, I, I would take the long side. <laughs> you but I, I'm not buying any. I, I, but uh, uh, the these are powerful, powerful ideas with big potential, and he's executed. And he's executed on it, and and that's what you tip your hat to. Now, have you been in the process of looking for other companies? Back to your ninety-five billion. I thought it was ninety billion. You told me last week it's ninety-five billion in yeah, cash and I, cash we, equivalents. We put, our, we put our our ten Q over the weekend, and then okay. I think if you add up the cash every place. Now, I don't really count all of it. That's a regulated industry. But but if you take the balance sheet and you add up treasury bills, cash, and equivalents, and you know, it goes up every month. It's higher now than it was on March 31st. And again, the arenas, you're looking for deals anywhere, but probably something north of $5 billion or the type that you really... Yeah. Further north, the better. I'd like to be at the North Pole. <laughs> okay. Uh, guys, we're going to have more from Warren Buffett in just a few minutes, including when we come back. We'll ask him what the most important factor is in determining uh, market valuations right now. It's a question that we'll put to him right after this break. Good morning again, everybody, and welcome back to this special edition of Squawk Box. We are live in Omaha, Nebraska, with Berkshire Hathaway's chairman and CEO Warren Buffett in his first sit-down interview since speaking to the Berkshire faithful, the 40,000 or so shareholders who convened here just across the street this weekend. And, uh, Warren, you mentioned something to me in the commercial break back before, that there is uh, one essential factor that will determine uh, what you think about market prices and market valuations. What, what, what is that? Yeah, I can tell you the right question. I can't tell you the right answer necessarily. <laughs> the, uh, the most important item over time in, in, value, in, in valuation is, is obviously interest rates. I mean, if, if interest rates are destined to be at very low levels, not necessarily as low as they are now, but, but very low compared to 100-year averages or 50-year averages, it makes any stream of earnings from investments worth more money. I mean, if you're, if you're bogey, the bogey is always what, what government bonds yield. Now you can pick your maturity and, and, a th and you see it in real estate. Real estate yields adapt quite, quite quickly and fairly directly 
uh, with interest rates of an appropriate length. But st stocks don't do it as much, but it's the same principle. Any investment is worth all the cash you're going to get out between now and Judgment Day discounted back. Well, the discounting back is affected by whether you choose interest rates like those of Japan or interest rates like those we had in 1982 before Paul Volcker took a sledgehammer to the economy. Yeah. So when we had 15% short-term rates in 1982, it was silly to pay 20 times earnings for stocks unless you felt that, that the world was going to change in a very material way. Well, it's, it's a huge bargain to buy stocks now if you knew these interest rates would stay at this level. And, uh, and you could buy 30-year bonds. I mean, in Europe, they've been selling 50-year bonds. So, I mean, people are making a judgment every day. I mean, the yardstick is there. It's just a question of whether you believe the yardstick or not. But that, that is something we don't like to incorporate into what will pay for a business, but it is incorporated in the market. It's not fully incorporated in the market. The stock market is dirt cheap now if these interest rates were guaranteed for 10 or 15 or 20 years. And of course, a 20-year bond, that's, <laughs> you are in a sense making that kind of commitment. But that's the, big, that's, the big thing, that's the big thing investors have to think about. Um, when you start thinking about that, Ben Bernanke was on with us uh, just a week ago on Squawk Box, mm -hmm. and he, he talked about how he thinks interest rates are going to be much lower for a long time to come. It's kind of the new normal theory around 3% or so. Does that sound like something that you would buy into? Well, it's something I'd consider, but nobody thought we were going to, in 2009, nobody thought we would have a recovery like we've had and employment coming back a couple hundred thousand month, month after month. I mean, the economy is doing well now. And no, I don't think people thought we were going to have that for seven or eight years. And rates only inch up as much as they have. Now, in part, I do think that's because Europe is so low that the degree of difference you want to have from there and the consequences for the dollar and then the consequences for export industries and all kinds of things enter into how large a differential we really would want from a place like Europe. But nobody thought Japan, if you go back 30 years ago, nobody thought Japan was going to have these rates 30 years hence. Uh, and I didn't think in 2009 we would have these rates seven or eight years hence. And ben Bernanke said the same thing, that he didn't think rates would still be this no, low at this and, point. And if there is something about this world that is going to cause interest rates to be very, very low, stocks will look very cheap, and I will have passed up buying some businesses I should have bought. We, we've had a guest on who, who posited he thinks that interest rates will go back to zero percent sometime in the next yeah. five years because he thinks we'll hit a recession. And it, when you realize how long it has taken us to build up, there's not a lot of dry powder there. It's not outside the realm of the possible. Yeah. Well, well, we'll have recessions from time to time, but we had, we had a recession when, when rates were 15 percent short term, too. So I, I don't think anybody can predict them. That's the problem. I certainly don't think I can predict them. I obviously have ranges in my mind and all sorts of things. The one thing I know is I don't like them uh, from the standpoint of investing Berkshire's capital at this level. I will pay you more. You don't for like treasuries, you mean? Well, well they, like they're a, a big, big, big drag on returns. Right. And I will pay more for businesses when they are this low after I've, I've sort of become used to this. I mean, I, I don't think it's unthinkable that they stay low for a very long time. And by low, I mean 100 basis points higher than where they are now. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's the big variable for investors. I mean, you, uh, you said you have a, a range in your mind that you kind of keep out. What, what is your range that you're thinking out? For how well, many years? It's not that good. Yeah. <laughs> but I would say this. Anybody that prefers bonds today to stocks is making a big mistake. I've been saying that year after year after year. Now, I, don't, I won't say that under all circumstances, but... But it is ridiculous, in my view, for somebody to buy a 30-year bond, and some countries 50-year bonds and so on, at these rates, in preference to buying stocks. Stocks will bounce around a lot more, and they can go down 50 percent. But a 30-year bond can go down 50 percent, too, at, at these rates. And it, bonds are a terrible choice against stocks, and I've been saying that a long time. And, and, and it, it's just dictated by, by mathematics. Okay, great. Uh, Warren, again, thank you uh, for your time.
We're calling this a meeting of the minds today. Um, three incredibly intelligent uh, people who are sitting down with us who have expertise in a series of some of the biggest issues facing our nation today. Charlie Munger is the vice chair of Berkshire Hathaway. Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft and the head of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Warren Buffett, of course, is still with us. And, uh, gentlemen, I, I was thinking that we could sit down and, and put all that brain power to work with some of the big issues that's facing our, our country right now. You all have spent a lot of time thinking about these issues, investing money in these issues, and working on these issues. Um, and I thought we'd start with health care, um, not only because the health care bill that was passed last week in the House, but, Warren, you made some comments about that over the weekend at the meeting, and, Charlie, you followed up with a few comments of your own, so I thought we'd jump right in when it comes to health care. Warren, you, you mentioned that um, when it comes to business, when it comes to the nation, uh, but even for businesses, health care is more important than tax reform is because it's such a big chunk of GDP and such a big chunk of, of, of businesses' costs. Why don't you lay out what you think about where we stand right now with health care and what you think about the bill that was passed? Yeah. You, you probably hear more from business leaders about corporate taxes uh, being uh, uh, causing them to fight with one hand tied behind their back in terms of foreign competition. Corporate taxes, a percentage of GDP, have gone down from about 4% in 1960 to 2%. So they've been cut in half as a percentage of GDP. But health care has gone from 5% of GDP to 17% of GDP. And business pays a lot of the health care costs. So you've, you've lost 12 points. And there's only 100 cents in the dollar. But you've lost 12 points. Now, in other countries, uh, the most industrialized countries, a number of them were also around 5% in 1960. And some of those have gone up to maybe 11 or something of the sort. But in terms of costs of manufacturing and really everything throughout the economy that gets related to health care, and health care is one-seventh, one-sixth of the whole economy, uh, we've had a 12-point movement against American business, and it continues. And uh, I don't see anything necessarily in the, in the horizon that, uh, that uh, would cause that number to be, I think it's more likely to go up than down unless we change something fundamental. When something has happened to that extent, you better not count on it reversing itself from natural causes. There's a reason why it's happening, and you better attack the reason if you care about changing the course of the, uh, of the cost. Charlie, let's, let, let's get your perspective on this. You are the, the head of Good Samaritan Hospital. You're the chairman of Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles, so you know health care uh, on a very firsthand basis when it comes to this. Uh, the whole you... system is cal calcumanic. It's almost ridiculous in its complexity, and it's steadily increasing cost. And Warren is absolutely right. It, it gives our companies a big disadvantage in competing with other manufacturers. They've got single-payer medicine, and we, we're paying it out of the company. You've also said, though, that uh, there are some incredibly good aspects about our health care system, that well, you're, you're we, better off being we, sick here than anywhere else. We have the best medicine at the top, and we invented 60 percent of the world's good drugs. So we're, you know, we're an amazing place, but if you look at it up close, the amount of waste from overtreatment of the dying is just disgusting. There's a lot wrong with the system. How would you fix it? I would go to some form of Medicare for all, and I would police it pretty hard to keep out the fraud. Which is universal health care system, essentially. Yeah, with, with more anti-fraud. Yet the same thing in workman's comp. There's a lot of fraud and abuse in the workman's comp system. And the only way to keep it out is to be very tough on it all the time. And, of course, the government's not very good at that. It's you a know, good... what's the incentive for some employee for the government fighting some poor guy with a broken back who, who's lying about everything? And so it, it's a very serious problem. But I think we should have single-payer medicine eventually, and I think we should squeeze a lot of the fraud and folly out of the system. You're a Republican, so... Yes, but I'm, a, I'm not a normal Republican. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how would you get us to that point? Well, it's very hard, but I think it's they go to these cockamamie systems taking care of all the insurances. It just gets more and more complicated. And there's a lot to be said for having a basic health care, like Medicare, Medicaid, that's for all. Bill, you want to weigh in on that? 
Well, there, there's sort of two issues. There's how much money is there to help people with health care, and then are you changing the system uh, so it's more efficient in some way? And it's a bit disappointing we don't have more ideas about bringing costs down. Uh, I think it's a super important problem. I think a lot of uh, uh, both politicians and non-politicians should come together on that. But the issue of the taxes and access, um, which are also important, but they're getting most of the debate. So efficiency, uh, even during the Obama years, was not the primary discussion. One of the interesting things is that Kaiser Permanente, a nonprofit bureaucracy, if the whole nation had Kaiser Permanente care, the average quality of the care would go way up and the cost would go down. So some people are doing a pretty good job. What do they do? What is the secret? Have well, you... they don't overtreat the dying, and they have very good internists and pediatricians that they hire right out of medical school. It's just a very good system, and the people who, who have the Kaiser Permanente care like it. Charlie, do you worry that if we went to single-payer health care system, we would lose the good parts of our system? The no, innovation? I think you would have an alternative system that people could use. We already have that. We have a lot of our best doctors have opted out of Medicare. Mm -hmm. They just go to concierge medicine. They just leave the system. We have various ways that people who want to pay more and have somewhat better care, they think. Uh, and uh, of course, we'd want that. It's a safety valve. And that's what Europe has. You can opt out and buy your own. You can go to some other country and get your medical care. Or you can take the state. But nobody in any of these advanced countries, including Canada, has the least interest of giving up Medicare for, I mean, medicine for all. Warren, you pointed out. Uh, and it hasn't ruined their capitalism either. But Warren. Even did, like Canada doesn't have any capitalism. <laughs> Warren, you did point out over the weekend, though, that our, our medical system subsidizes all those other nations. I believe it was you, maybe it was Charlie, someone said this over, that in terms of innovation, um, well, I think I, I think it's true. I think somebody else may have emphasized that, but but we get paid for it. Uh, but uh, Bill would know far more about this than I would. But in terms of the major improvements in medical care or medicines, uh, for 320 million people out of seven billion, uh, we've probably done quite a bit more than our share. But I, I defer to Bill on that. Bill. Well, it's absolutely true that the companies here, in terms of inventing new procedures, drugs, vaccines, they've done a great job. Those are sold globally. Uh, you could say there's a small factor that because we uh, go first and because of the way the pricing system works, that a tiny bit of our medical costs do accrue to uh, the world. It's an industry in which the U.S. is strong and the number of jobs in that area uh, I've actually shifted into the United States in, instead of out. It's a, a it's bright spot. It's an unusual spot. system, though, in that the innovation and heavy research and all that is very, very, very largely concentrated on coming up with better products, which we'd love to have. But you don't see them handing out any awards for bringing down costs. I mean, if you have a steel business or a retail business, I mean, you, you're trying to offer a better product all the time to your customer. You're also trying to bring down costs with a vengeance at the same time. And that, I don't think that exists in the medical business. And it's 17 percent of the economy. Bill, Bill pointed out that there are two ways of looking at this. One is you have to look at the cost efficiencies to bring down the prices. The other is decide how much money you're going to be using to fund all of this. And Warren, you said over the weekend that your tax bill would have been 17 percent lower um, had the proposed tax plan that, that the House has now passed been in place last year. Yeah. No, it, based on the House bill, I'm a lot healthier now than I was a week ago, financially. <laughs> they, uh, if, if the bill were enacted as, as written, and I don't know all the provisions, but I do know this provision, although it's received really a very minor amount of press, uh, I just did my tax return a month ago, and uh, my income tax was a little less than four, four million dollars. And there's line 62, and there's 680,000 or something like that on there. And line 62 disappears uh, under this bill. So I saved $680,000 on a little less than four million. 
and I haven't done anything this week. I, you know, I, I mean, I just watched the people vote in Congress. And I would say this, if this elimination of a tax applies on invest, net investment income, if you have, if a couple has $250,000 a year or more of income, I think it would be very interesting for the constituents of every congressman that voted for that bill to ask question, just one question, are you above 250 on your adjusted gross income? And if you were, how much would you have saved from what you paid last year from this bill you just passed? Meaning that they are voting for a tax cut for themselves Absolutely. personally while they're... Oh, anybody that has over 250 and has some net investment income. And, and the numbers get very big. I mean, I've had years when there have been a lot more than 680000 But I'm $680,000 better off if everything else is equal just because of what happened this week. Now, it has to go through the Senate and make a change to Congress and a lot of other things. But it was huge what they did on cutting taxes for the rich in this. I mean, if there's one clear-cut uh, message that comes out of that bill, it is we're going to cut the hell out of income taxes for the rich on investment income. Bill, have you analyzed the bill, the, the health care bill? And the, do, you, do you agree with that? Well, you, Warren's correct. There's a 3.8 percent tax that kicks in at a very high level of capital gains. It was the Obama uh, surcharge, the Obamacare surcharge. And that goes in. away. Um, so that's a super progressive tax that uh, may not continue. It may, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because this has to go through the Senate and then be... Right. Right. But you already have something like Medicaid for everybody. If you are so impaired you need to be in a nursing home and you're out of assets, you automatically qualify to have your nursing home bills paid. And they don't let your doctor come by and walk by 20 beds and bill $40 to the government every three days. He's only allowed to come by and bill very seldom. We have a system that polices the caregivers and provides Medicare for them and Social Security disability. If you're sick enough. You're, you're, you get total, you're in, you're in Medicare. We, we also... We, we, we've already gone a long way towards single payer. It's not a revolutionary idea. Would you agree with that, Bill and, Bill and Warren? Do you agree with the single payer idea? I, I personally do. Yeah, I think you, you do have to... Police it. Yeah, it's got to be policed. I mean, you have Veterans Affairs uh, that's like a, a Kaiser... Um, no, it's worse. Okay, fine. <laughs> it's high, Kaiser. I, I certainly agree. Kaiser is an exemplar of, of quality, and they've gotten the incentive systems quite right. 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 It, it shows it can be done. Their incentive systems, if I'm correct, are they pay doctors a salary? Right. And the doctor does not get rich in Kaiser, but he has a very nice life. Right. And how, had, how many people? Don't they, it's more than ten million, isn't it? The, the, oh, the, sure. The, yeah. I mean, this is not a small system. But the doctor has a set number of hours as it's not working. What happens video. is they give the doctor a life. You know, you can be a woman doctor and you can work 50 hours a week instead of 90. And, it, and they've got good people. It, it's a good system. Yeah, they, it's really a successor to the health maintenance organization, which was not pleased well, uh, but it ha gets rid of the incentive for over-treating now they've done it and done it really well without any of the the problems the HMOs had historically. Germany doesn't overtreat either. They just they just the, the system has just made sensible. When you talk about overtreating, you talk about the way that we pay per uh, per, per transaction. I, we let, we per, let the caregiver, or the hospital, and the doctor decide what should be done when they're getting paid for it, and naturally they decide that a lot of things should be done. Instead of caring for the outcome to try and get patients healthier and better. In fact, Charlie, you mentioned over the weekend a hospital that had incredible rates for, for heart surgeries. In Reading, doing. yes. I said that nobody goes through heart surgery better than the man who doesn't need it at all. <laughs> for, for it's a good way of increasing your success rate. Is just yeah. <laughs> But can you expand for the uh, for the people who weren't listening this weekend who didn't know about that? There was one hospital in particular. Yes, and, the, and the, the people, the doctors thought they were doing the Lord's work. It shows the capacity of the human mind to delude itself.
because they were doing surgeries on totally unnecessary surgeries and and nobody died because they didn't work sick in the first place <laughs> and, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and just huge volumes and the system didn't catch it that's that is wrong our system should get one of the guys who's good at this stuff is they told go on to you Harvard Medical School he is he's doing a lot of good in medicine what what types of things is well, he saying? Well, he wants everybody to use checklists and make fewer errors and not have perverse incentives. And he was the one that blew the whistle on McAllen, Texas. The doctors up there were just totally abusing Medicare. They just cross-referred to everybody for a lot of unnecessary stuff. And so they were all getting paid very heavily. And that one little place was spending twice as much as ordinary places. And when Ito blew the whistle on them, they stopped doing it. When Charlie read that article, we, knows, we need more of that. When Charlie read that article, yeah, he, he actually, I, I, you sent twenty-five thousand dollars to the New Yorker to give to the author of it just because you thought he made a contribution to society. Yeah, he sent it back, <laughs> and I finally got him to take it, so he gave it to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Can we shift to tax reform and where you all think about this? How much time, if any, uh, you've spent, Warren? I'm guessing you've spent some time thinking about tax reform and what you think needs to happen. Well. Corporate. Yeah, course, let's start on the corporate. Just, just the word reform. Reform. I mean, reform is usually when your taxes are cut. <laughs> it, it'll be tax change, but and whether uh, whether it's a better tax system or not depends on how it's constructed. And, and uh, uh, well, you know. our taxes are the corporate taxes. Uh, something that is a competitive disadvantage for American corporations. Not much. Not much. No, I I can't think of any business where we're in where our tax rate. Uh, puts us at a, and we're in a lot of businesses, a significant disadvantage with foreign countries. For one thing, ours aren't as high as we think they are in many cases. They're not as low elsewhere. I mean, the actual, Corporate taxes are 2 the, percent. Instead of, of paying, instead of paying 35 percent, many companies are paying sure, much lower. Sure. And, as a, and 2 percent of GDP is, is not a high by U.S. standards. And, and then when you compare it to 17 percent for health care, I mean, it's, you know, Every, every business person is going to go there and say our taxes are too high. And if they really try and make it revenue neutral, uh, you know, my guess is it won't pass <laughs> because, the <laughs> because the people who, for whom it goes up are going to argue against it harder than the people where it goes down. I mean, it's great for lobbyists and all that. So if they talk about it being... They always talk about it being tax neutral. If it's tax neutral, I don't think it'll pass. Yeah, tax neutral is one way, but other people that we've talked to, including Stephen Mnuchin and others, have said that, look, we have dynamic scoring that can bring this in. And as a result, we think we can bring taxes far down and not necessarily has a, have a pay for as you go along with that. Well, of course, everybody's gotten the idea based on the, the world's success in printing money and not paying too much of a penalty. Everybody has a notion you can just cut taxes and you don't have to raise revenues. That is a very dangerous thing to do. The fact that it's worked pretty well some of the time does not mean it always will. Dynamic score. I've never seen anybody introduce dynamic scoring that says that, that things will come out worse than, than just indicated by the figures. And, and clearly sometimes it does. Although, I am very suspicious of dynamic scoring. Do you agree that there's some sort of a laffer curve, though, where you raise taxes to a certain point and it is a law of diminishing returns? If you get taxes to 100 percent. Uh, actually, some people would work that, but very few. <laughs> no, it's, but that's not, that is not an, an argument for changing uh, my taxes at all, you know, except upward. Uh, uh, it's, uh, everybody that wants it cut in taxes, you know, they hire some academics. And, and, they, and they look for dynamic scoring, and they say the country will really be better off if I pay less tax. <laughs> and, and, and it's very under, I mean, I don't blame them. It's understandable. <laughs> and uh, so be very, very, very suspicious of dynamic scoring. If we had a simpler tax code, one that would not allow for so many loopholes, one that would not make it worthwhile for big companies to employ legions of accountants to try and make use of those loopholes, would that not be better? Well, if, it, I, if, if it did nothing other than just even up. it out so that everybody's paying the same... If you free up labor that is now engaged in a lot of senseless procedures and put them to work in a market system and things that the market demands, that is a plus. There's no question about it. Well, there's another issue, which is the certainty of the tax code yeah. uh, and leaving it alone. If you create, if you're constantly switching and say, no, this switch may have gotten rid of a few accounts, now this switch gets rid of them, 
then you are getting, everybody has to learn the new stuff, and uncertainty is not good. You know, you, you'd like, once you pick a tax system, to leave it alone for a long, long time. We've heard business leader after business leader, though, say that it, uh, this is an uncompetitive situation. If you're an American manufacturer, you have things that are coming against you. If you are a technology company, maybe you have a lot of money that you're keeping offshores. Bill, do you think that it would be better if the tax system were reformed? You've been a little quieter on this. I don't think that the success of the technology sector will be improved by some tax change. There are the tech companies are not starving right now, and this only comes up when you have profits, and these companies have very high profits. So <coughs> it's not like we're going to be stronger in the, the tech sector by making uh, owners of, of those stocks richer. Apple has a quarter of a trillion dollars that it's keeping much of it offshore. Would it make sense to have that money brought back to the United States? Does it matter? I would say yes, it does matter, and I don't see why we don't want people artificially shifting money to some foreign place to avoid U.S. taxes. But it's not artificial if you're really making the money in the foreign place and they don't have high taxes. Why, why, why should we care if somebody makes a lot of money in some foreign place and brings it back at a low tax? I, I think there's a lot. Having all this money piled up abroad and then borrowing against it artificially. It's a cockamamie system. So how do we fix it? Well, I think they'd, they'd bring it back if you had a one-time forgiveness, and I don't think that would hurt anybody. The tax holiday, we tried that in the Bush administration. Yeah, and it worked. It worked lot, temporarily. Lot of money came I, back. Yeah. yeah. But if, if you have a holiday, then they, the, that encourages more investment abroad, and particularly in artificial places. To wait for figure, the next you know, holiday. We'll, we'll, we'll bring it back later on. I mean, there, there's, there are some countries that are very small countries. <laughs> That an awful lot of business has been done, and, yeah. And and if 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 the consequence of doing that is you get a big break occasionally, you're going to try and figure out how to do more of it. It doesn't increase investment in the United States; it increases investment in some place where you still got a low rate. Maybe you'll get it back again. Well, I'd, I'd go down, come down hard on all that stuff where you shift some patent that was invented here and send it over to Liechtenstein. And, and collect all our patent royalties. It's 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 g gaming the system, but assuming you actually have made the money abroad, and the, the taxes abroad are low, I don't see why we should impose a big tax on them when they bring it back. Charlie, you uh, you would be a pretty strict dictator if you were running things, wouldn't you? <laughs> certainly <laughs> a, he certainly is a Berkshire. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like if fraud runs rampant, saying we're in scamp. Yeah. It just feeds on itself like cancer. So you've got to constantly police it. And a lot of people just won't do the work. It's a huge mistake because you're ruining your country as everybody gets sucked into the fraud and they do it because everybody else is doing it. So I'm, I'm a great believer in coming down hard on that stuff, way harder than the government does and other people do. Kind of like Singapore? Yes. Well, lot, <laughs> I'm a big admirer of Singapore. You're right about that. Caning. Well, he's, also, he's also in charge of public relations at Berkshire. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, just in terms you know, that of... Canning actually leaves a scar. <laughs> <laughs> they're, quite, they're quite serious. <laughs> I never noticed that. <laughs> well, maybe... You haven't lived in Mungerville. <laughs> Bill, very quickly, just the, the, the idea of a constant tax code, as you mentioned. A, a holiday, a tax holiday doesn't necessarily f uh, lend into that idea. And uh, I'm guessing you're getting at the idea that American businesses want to know what the rules of the road are before they will invest on a, on a long period over many, many years. Yeah, a lot of government policies, um, including taxes, you want great predictability. And so it'll be in It'll be interesting to see what they do. Uh, the overseas money, although it's kind of a, a complicated thing, it's not, it's not like when that money comes to the U.S., people will start building factories that they weren't building otherwise. It doesn't change the, the profit potential of, of capital but investment. they're more likely to do something with it. Yeah, but some was, some was already lent to us. I mean, or it's lent to... XYZ Corporation. In other words, when 
when companies go to the market in the United States, foreign subsidiaries of, of companies that have so-called tra trapped cash buy those bonds. I mean, so it, it actually goes from an industry that doesn't have much use for the capital to somebody that really does have some plans for the capital under the present system. Great. Uh, gentlemen, if you'll uh, bear with us for just a moment, we're going to slip in a quick break. Welcome back to a special edition of Squawk Box, where we are live in Omaha, Nebraska, with Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates. Uh, we are calling this a meeting of the minds and trying to tackle some of the big issues facing our nation and our world today. Um, we've already spoken about health care here in the United States and the tax reform that, that's underway. Uh, Bill, I thought we could talk a little bit about the budget process, because this is something that matters to you at the Gates Foundation. Um, you, you spend, what, about $5 billion a year? In, in, in programs trying to improve people's lives. I think there's something like 122 million children's lives that have been saved through vaccinations and nutrition provided by the Gates Foundation over the years. When we start hearing things about cuts in the State Department, an 18 percent cut to the State Department budget, what, what does that mean? What would that happen? What would happen to the projects that you have worked on over the years? Yeah, what's amazing is the success uh, that our foundation working in partnership with the U.S. and others has had at improving health and, and that helped stabilize these countries uh, so that they can get out of their poverty trap. It also lets us see any health problems like a pandemic coming out of those problem countries so we can protect Americans from that. There was a proposal that the State Department would have been cut 28 percent, which for these health-related things would have been a uh, um, much bigger cut. And so we're glad that, uh, you know, it looks like the Congress won't uh, make those cuts because they don't think we're so weak that we need to withdraw the malaria bed nets or the HIV medicine. I'm very lucky that I get to go and see uh, the great success uh, and then, you know, say to the U.S. taxpayer, hey, we are performing miracles here. 122 million. Uh, children's lives saved, over 10 million people who are alive uh, because we helped provide the drugs, the HIV drugs, the PEPFAR program that uh, started under President Bush. Uh, so I think we're strong enough to help stabilize these countries, uh, see the pandemics early, and I think the Congress will maintain these investments. Um, so I'm, you know, I, that, I think that's very smart. We are getting close to a goal that you've been after for some time, which is the eradication of polio. Uh, how many cases this year? Uh, we've had five this year. Every day I get up, you know, check to see if there's a new case. Uh, right now, all the cases are in Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, we're still making sure in Nigeria, where Boko Haram is, we're still a little worried, have we missed some cases there? But those are the two hot spots, and so with luck, this will be the last year where we have any cases. If, if you go a year with no cases, then it's declared eradicated? How does that work? Actually, they make you go three years, which is wise, because uh, they want to make sure you don't miss any. And so we'd start that three-year clock at the end of this year if things go well, which right now uh, is on track. Uh, I'll be going to Rotary for their 100th anniversary in June and congratulating them because they've been very involved in this and have, uh, uh, their workers have volunteered, they've, they've raised resources, they've spoken out. They're uh, one of the big heroes in this whole effort. You know, they, there it was a big shift, I think, in, in overall thinking. The election, this past election, reflected that. Americans are worried about their own jobs. There's big chunks, swaths of the of the country where they feel like jobs have left, they have not been replaced. And Warren, we talked about this a little earlier about job training programs that haven't been there. But in, in people who have, have suffered through these issues of job losses here in the United States probably will look at it and say, we need to take care of ourselves instead of looking abroad. Um, Charlie, what, what do you say to people like that? Well, there's a long tradition of Americans going after the worst poverty and disease abroad. John D. Rockefeller was one of the best philanthropists that ever lived, and Bill is following his example place after place. Rockefeller saved more damn lives, and, of course, he, uh, Rockefeller has helped bring in the miracle grains. And the private philanthropy has a good, good record, and 
And what I like about what Gates and Buffett are doing is they're tackling stuff that other people don't. Uh, Joe has a question as well. Joe? It's on this topic, and, and it's for, for Bill Gates. Uh, I promised I'd ask this question, Bill, for um, a, a gentleman that runs a school in one of the poorest uh, parts of the world. And I, I think you've kind of answered it already. It's, it's hard to, you know, if you have health concerns, it's hard to have education. But his point is that he wishes that you would f focus even more on education. He says that, that poverty is a bigger concern than health. And, and the problem is, if the economy is too small for the number of people in it, there's no way to, to do anything about, the, you know, the, the, these lives that these people have unless you grow the economy. So his point is that you get a better return from education than maybe from, from health care. Uh, but I think you've already answered it. You, it's hard to get an education if you're, if you're dealing with health problems as well. It's a chicken and egg thing, I guess. That's right. You really need both. If a kid is malnourished, um, they're not developing their, either their body or their brain. Uh, so first is health, then is education, then third is a government that creates opportunity. And when those three come together, you get out of this poverty trap. And uh, so the U.S. government funds we've been talking about, some of those do go to uh, international education. And that's why a lot of aid recipients like India, uh, Brazil, Mexico, even South Korea in the 1970s, they have gotten out of poverty and now they've turned around and they're contributing. Uh, we need to do that same thing for the poor countries in Africa. Okay. Warren, you, you, you spent, I, I believe, $2.9 billion that you gave back to the Gates Foundation last year and the other four family foundations that you have. Uh, this has been several years, many years that you've been doing this. Um, I know you you believe very strongly in the, the foundation's uh, cause, trying to make sure that all people have healthier and, um, and, and, and improved lives. But when you start thinking about that, it's massive amounts of money that you all are spending on this. But why is the government money so important to go along with this? Can philanthropists just do it by themselves? Well, five billion is a lot of money, but uh, if you're talking about percentages of budgets, uh, uh, Bill can give you better figures on this. The, the United States actually lags behind a number of countries in terms of the percentage uh, we use for foreign aid and that sort of thing. But the answer is, we were, all three of us, we're so lucky to be born in this country. It, uh, I mean, it, it's incredible what has been accomplished here. And that can be maybe not replicated 100 percent around the world, but, but, but if you believe every life has equal value, I believe that, and Bill believes that, Melinda believes it, my children believe it, uh, the question is, what can you do to push that along so not only does every life have equal value, but every life has equal opportunity? And uh, health enters into that, obviously, huge. Uh, uh, governmental policies do. Education, uh, health is the one that uh, you can see the impact on. Uh, uh, Bill can give you the figures on the number of, of kids five and younger that die every year in the world. It's been cut in half in, what, 30 years or something like that, Bill? And, you know, his goal is to cut it in half again. Uh, I mean, just think of the difference. I mean, you know, if, you, if you have children of your own, you know, how, how would it have been if they'd you'd lived in some terrible part of the world? Uh, so it, it, it just seems obvious that... that uh, uh, you help people around you, and you help people around the world. Bill, you, you're, you're a bit of a statesman. You travel the world, um, bringing this mission um, to other countries. You also probably spend some time in Washington. What, what, have you, what have you thought in terms of what Washington is thinking these days uh, about foreign aid missions? Well, the history is the U.S. has been generous, uh, not at the level of other countries, but uh, because we have a large economy, uh, in absolute, we give the most. So it's $30 billion a year going out to help these poor countries. Uh, Germany and the U.K. are tied for second at about $18 billion each. And so the scale of government resources is what lets us get the bed nets and the HIV medicine out there. Philanthropy alone couldn't do it. Um, it can try out new things in an innovative way, uh, but only that government-level generosities let us achieve these incredible goals. And 
As I've met with the Congress, I've been impressed uh, the, at the commitment to continuing this uh, by both parties. Have you spoken to Rex Tillerson, the head of the Secretary, the Secretary of State? I have, and I'm, I'm sure uh, I'll be talking with him a lot more because we're in partnership with the part of the State Department called USAID that is delivering that $30 billion. And we're always getting smarter about how we measure it, uh, how we uh, do it in a smarter way. And, and so uh, he'll be a key partner for us. Okay, uh, we're going to slip in a quick break right here. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everyone. We are live in Omaha, Nebraska this morning with Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and Bill Gates. And we've been talking about a lot of different issues this morning, but one thing, gentlemen, our viewers are always keen to hear are your insights into um, the markets, where you think about things. Uh, Warren already told us this morning that he thinks interest rates are the one key factor that determine whether markets are valued too rich or, or not. Um, and, and I just wonder if you two could add some comments to that. Bill, what do you think about the market's valuation these days? Well, the multiples are, are fairly high, and that's because, as Warren says, it's all benchmarked to the interest rate. So if interest rates go up a lot, uh, you'd expect some retreat from uh, these levels. Charlie, when you look around, is it hard to find deals these days? Is it hard to of find course. opportunities? Of course it's hard. We have an army of people in frenzied finance, and you know, we've got an army of people in so-called shadow banking who are financing these people to buy any companies they want with liberal leverage. And, of course, they pay high prices. They get part of the upside, and they don't take any of the downside, and, and they get fees off the top. So it's fee-driven buying, and it's, it's, it's very extreme. Of course, it makes it hard for us to buy companies. Do you find more opportunities in the United States or elsewhere right now? Well, we're not. We have long periods, and we don't do much anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we're thinking of space now. <laughs> that's why we, that's we're why we, out of opportunity. That's why we have so much in the way of Treasury notes. $95 billion, roughly, um, cash and cash equivalents. No, we don't, like, we don't like that, but... But there are times in finance when people just throw the money away as though it was or confetti. I think there's a lot of idiotic deal making in venture capital now, and there's a lot of idiot. It, if we had some big recession, I think a lot of this levered finance would present a lot of agony. Do you think? Uh, so I, I don't think that the future is just guaranteed to be all rosy. Do you think a recession's in the cards, or...? No, I don't think any of us know. Anybody that isn't modest about his theories about economics hasn't been paying attention in the last six years. People have been utterly surprised in things they deeply believed were fixed in the ground, weren't fixed at all. Who would have guessed that we could print all this money and not have any inflation? Do you think we've gotten out of this, or is this still a movie that has yet to... <coughs> or do you think that this is still a movie that we haven't seen the ending on yet? I think it's always a movie where you haven't seen the ending. One thing you know is there'll be good stretches and bad, bad stretches in the future. All three of you are in the positions you're in because you have had phenomenal successes in, in investing and in business. but. You didn't get there without some some hiccups along the way. Yeah, um, but when we got ahead, we're pretty conservative. I, I ask this just because Warren has talked about his worst trades in the past, and Warren, I, I believe you said it was Berkshire Hathaway itself that was your worst trade. Yeah, but I have plenty of other competitors. <laughs> 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 the three basic businesses, there are three companies came together for Berkshire actually: diversified retailing and blue chip stamps were two others, and the base companies of both of the other two totally failed, dis disappeared. So, so we're three for three in terms of our building blocks. <laughs> and we thought they were all, we thought they were okay at the time, didn't we, Charlie? Well, we, they, we bought them so cheaply that we, yeah. we could turn them in more money than we paid, and then we took the money and bought these other companies. So it, it wasn't as though we lost big chunks of money. It's just that it was such a dumb way to do business, scrambling around with those... <laughs> unfashionable dying businesses, <laughs> textile mills in New England. The power costs in the 
south on the TBA country were 60% lower than they were in New England, and a textile is a congealed piece of electricity. What kind of an idiot would go into textiles in New England? The guy on your right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, if you had to go back through the years, what would you qu uh, quantify as your worst trade that you've ever that you've ever made? Well, if I, I went way back, I could find you trades when I levered a bunch of convertible bonds, and you know, if you go back to the very earliest Munger struggling for rationale, you'd find some dumb trades. Every smart guy is tempted by leverage. Yes, and some of them are broken by it. And it's somewhat capricious in terms of which ones get broken. Would you say, Charlie? Sure. And Charlie came close. <laughs> <laughs> Is there one that stings in particular? Well, every failure stings. It took a long time. I made a tech company investment, and we damn near went broken. We hovered on the edge of a precipice for about three or four years, and it was agony, and it was a lot of money to me at the time. Now we scrambled out of it with a pretty good profit. But it wasn't the world's smartest investment, and it took a lot of intelligence scrambling to rectify the situation. And I'm not looking to repeat <laughs> the dumb decisions that got me there. We'll find new ones. Yeah. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Phil, how about you? What's the worst trade you think you've ever made, or one of? Well, my expertise, our purported expertise, is more in uh, software. And so things like uh, you know, my role in not having Microsoft lead in search or not lead in the phone operating systems. Or in the, or in the cloud. Right. Uh, <laughs> but we're number two there. Uh, yeah, but, but you, uh, you, you started five years late. <laughs> yeah, so those are the ones that I think about at night more than uh, stock trades. Uh, I do have a heavy weighting in terms of the investment team I work with in Mexico, so we're not looking too smart right now, but I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that uh, will turn around quite well. Andrew, I think you have a question as well. Hey, Becky, um, really this question is for Warren, and it comes from a number of shareholders who sent in emails after the annual meeting who said that we, meaning Becky and I and, and Carol, missed asking you directly what your views were of Donald Trump and uh, his performance thus far as the president when it relates to the economy. So I thought I would just ask it straight up. Well, I don't think he's had an effect on that much of an effect on the economy yet. And I said a year ago at the annual meeting, much of the, I, I was 100 percent for Hillary and did a lot of fundraising and all of that sort of thing. And and to the, discuss to some of my friends, I thought I said I thought Bircher would do fine uh, under either person as president. And now that doesn't mean you can't have recessions under either one. I'm, but. but the president is probably overemphasized. The presidency is it's the most important job in the world, but it's still overemphasized in in its relevancy to stock market fluctuations or even business prosperity. Uh, we'll see how it all plays out. But uh, I do not make investment or, or business decisions based on who is president or who I think is going to be president. Warren, one, okay. one follow-up. Have, have we ever made it? Oh, excuse me. Okay, go ahead. No, no, no. One follow-up came from another shareholder who, who asked, given, uh, given the, well, I'll, I'll read it to you. Given the many CEOs that have been supportive of Trump and it seemed to have his ear now as president, uh, do you think that your support of Hillary Clinton has had any impact on Berkshire's ability to influence policy? No, I have never called a president in my life. Never. Uh, and uh, uh, and I've never really sent messages to a president through a cabinet member or anything of the sort. Uh, uh, so and I and obviously I've not done so with Trump either. So uh, our and I've never Berkshire Hathaway parent now at, at, at the subsidiaries where they have specific interest in railroads or utilities. They've employed lobbyists. I'm sure, oh, I know they have, and they've made political contributions. Berkshire Hathaway parent has never. To my knowledge, uh, employed a lobbyist and certainly has never made a contribution in 52 years to a political candidate from the dog catcher up to the uh, up, up to the president of the United States. My idea is that generally there's way too much hatred in American politics, and the, the parties hate each other so much they both get quite irrational. And I try to avoid that kind of dense hatred. 
Why should you expect perfectly rational behavior from a politician, whether on the left or the right? And what is so constructive about this miasma of hatred, which you see all the time? It's quite counterproductive for the country. And, and all these politicians are partly right. I think Trump was exactly right when he said he ought to get along with China, and he stopped talking about trade all the time. He's, he, he frequently does some learning that's quite admirable. In, in terms of learning, gentlemen, the, the three of you have spent an awful lot of time together, and you learn from your mistakes, but I guess you also learn from each other. Is there something that you can say that you've learned along the way? And, Warren, why don't I start with you? Well, I'd be crazy if I went around people like Charlie and Bill and wasn't learning. I mean, that, that's been the part of the great fun I've had with both of them. I mean, I've known them now both a long time. And when we have the annual meeting, and Charlie sits down next to me, uh, you know, I'm going to learn something <laughs> during the ensuing few hours. And the same way with, when I met Bill, I think we spent about 10 or 11 hours over there, and we were regarded as antisocial by the governor of the state of Washington, even because we wouldn't come out. So I, I can't think of much more fun than learning from other people. And, and these guys are, you know, they're unlimited resources in that way. They're much broader than I am. Uh, and, and, uh, so I've got way more to learn from them than they have from me, uh, and I take advantage of it. <laughs> what did you learn from Charlie yesterday, sitting next to him? What did I learn from Charlie? Charlie was uh, or two days ago, I should say. I know he has. I'd, I'd have to go over it, but I, I'll guarantee I, 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 I did, uh, Becky. Yeah. And just this morning we're talking about, you know, the, uh, essentially Kaiser. I mean, those, these are things I know something about, but it helps when I hear Charlie articulate uh, thoughts on it. It helps when I hear Bill articulate thoughts. On, on what could be done to improve the world. Bill, how about you? Well, it's been uh, really unbelievable for me to have uh, the friendship first with Warren and then with Charlie as well. Because they come at things from more of an economic business point of view and I'm more on the technical side, the fact that we often see things the same way is, is kind of amazing. And, uh, you know, the world's unfolded in all these surprising ways that take the financial recession. People still don't understand that, but as I sit and talk to the two of them, I get a sense of, okay, what would make that happen again? Um, also, even beyond numbers, just the way they think about people, the way they think about integrity, setting an example. Uh, I am a much better manager because I've known the two of them. Charlie, you mentioned over the weekend that um your wife wondered why you were spending so much time being so impressed with a, a young guy, uh, Warren well, Buffett. Cut, it wouldn't eat the carrots. Yeah. <laughs> or broccoli or spinach or Brussels yeah, sprouts right. or all that other stuff. <laughs> no, I just told her that's a very unusual young man. The wonderful wife that they had. She, she, she was. She was. Yeah, but she wasn't automatically in favor of a crew cut young man that only do everything, <laughs> operating from his sun porch. <laughs> she came to appreciate you, but it wasn't immediate. <laughs> well, I appreciated her immediately, <laughs> with better reason to. <laughs> what have you learned from from Warren and from Bill over the years? We've all learned a lot from each other and from the world. It's amazing, how, having worked so hard to learn, how much we don't know. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen to inflation five years out. We don't know whether we're going to have another recession. Well, we I know we're going to have another one just went, yeah. Yeah, we know there'll be another someday, <laughs> yes. And I do have one my only controversial idea, apart from my notion that we'll eventually get single-payer health care, and that is that my fellow Republicans that want to take away all this regulation of the major finance, I think that's bonkers. I think that if you're using the government's credit to maintain your deposits, you should behave in a pretty careful, standardized way. Let the people who want to swing for the fences get in a different form. But I don't think we want our too big for fail, fail places swinging for the fences. The argument. I think they, they've got a duty to behave conservatively. Yeah. Mrs. Berkshire behaves conservatively. We could, we could have made so much more money with no trouble by being just a little more leveraged. Do we really miss it? I don't, I don't think that. What difference does it make whether Warren has another few million dollars? 
The arguments in favor of rolling back some of the regulation on the banks are that, as a result, it's tougher for businesses to get access to credit. It's tougher for consumers to get access to credit, and that in turn slows down the economy and and hurts consumers and businesses along the way. Yeah, but that, they like the frenzied finance. Uh, some of the normal finance they worry about. It is true that some of the new regulation has taken banks out of financing leveraged buyouts directly, and that we have shadow banking instead to do that. I think that's fine. What's wrong with the shadow banking? Well, because you waited for the last two minutes for that controversial thought, we don't have more time to push you on that, so we'll let you have the last word on it. But uh, Warren, Charlie, Bill, we want to thank you very much for your time today. We certainly appreciate it, and uh, we appreciate your generosity with your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you.